The prospects of a lasting ceasefire in Syria have collapsed again as the bloody civil war between the government and rebel opposition forces deteriorates. Russian and American diplomats have been unable to extend last week's fleeting truce and instead are trading accusations over the horrific bombing of an aid convoy. The US says Russia or Syria were responsible, a claim Syria's president has denied in a rare TV interview. So what happened to the convoy? Who, was, uh, who should be held responsible? Those convoys were in the area of the militants, were in the area under the control of the terrorists. That's what they, that what they should accuse first, the people or the militants, the terrorists who are responsible of the security of this convoy. So we don't have any idea about what happened. Only, well, the only thing that we saw was a video of burnt car destroyed uh, trucks, nothing else. Bashar al-Assad also said coalition forces led by America deliberately bombed his soldiers in last week's mix-up in the country's east. It was four airplanes uh, that's been, uh, that, that kept attacking the position of the Syrian uh, troops for nearly one hour or a little bit more than one hour. You could not commit a mistake for more than one. So it was definitely intentional, not unintentional, as they claimed. The Syrian president claims the city of Aleppo is not under siege by his military. The men and women of the White Helmets might have a different view. They are the brave first responders to the daily bombardment from Syrian and Russian forces. Their work has saved tens of thousands of lives, but more than a hundred of the volunteers have been killed since 2013. President Assad accused the organisation of having an ulterior motive. Does that mean you would support the recent nomination of the White Helmets for a Nobel Peace Prize? It's not about the White Helmet, whether they are credible or not, because some organizations are politicized, that they use different uh, humanitarian uh, masks and umbrellas just uh, to implement certain agenda. A new Netflix documentary called The White Helmets gives a close-up view of the terrifying situation in Aleppo and the vital work of the volunteers. Joanna Natasagara is the film's producer and she joined me a short time ago from London. A warning, this contains some distressing images. Joanna, thanks for your time. Morning, Hayden. Well, I must say, having seen your film, what strikes me about it is the bravery and the spirit of these Syrian volunteers. How are they coping with the destruction that's been dealt out not only to their country but to their city of Aleppo? I think you can imagine how they're dealing. I mean, what you see in the documentary is the, is the story behind the news. You see the headlines every day in Aleppo and in the rest of Syria of, of daily bombs, of daily attacks. And these are volunteer first responders dealing with those bombs on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, that situation is still happening and they're still responding as we speak. One of the most incredible scenes in the film is the moment when a, a baby is rescued from the rubble after 16 hours buried under the rubble. That must have been a moment that stays with each and every person who was there as part of that rescue. Absolutely. This team from Ansari and Aleppo were there. They were digging for the 16 hours to, to uncover baby Mahmoud. He's less than a month old. Uh, and actually the sad news is Khalid Hara, who you see pull the baby out of that three-story building, actually died a number of weeks ago, responding in another attack, trying to save more people. What was it like when the baby was reunited in your film a couple of years later after the rescue? It's a really emotional moment. You're really seeing these, you know, very human interactions and first responders who have saved a baby who then see him at two years old, running around, laughing, doing all the normal things that a two-year-old does. Um, you can imagine the kind of emotional response for them and for us as a film team. It's a really beautiful moment. It's very difficult to get your head around from such a long distance how the people there are managing to survive this war. From the, the uh, conversations you had and the people you met from Syria, mm. do you find that they're somewhat desensitised to the violence, that uh, they don't quite know how to cope, so this is one option for them, it's to try and rescue people? 
You know, I don't think we can ever try to understand the horrors that they've been through, and I don't think that we'll really understand that until it's over. But certainly their unconscionable hope is something that's so inspiring to watch. The rest of us seem to struggle to, to understand a very complex situation in Syria. And, and you're right, you know, their response is, to, is just to keep on trying to save life and keep on trying to, 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 to look for hope in such a dark situation. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that the collapse of the ceasefire, and I, I saw in, in the news that on Thursday alone there were something like 14 airstrikes in the rebel-held parts of Aleppo. Uh, you must be quite concerned about the people who you were interviewing, and are you still in touch? Do you know how they are? We are in touch. We've been in touch with them since we filmed with them in January, and the situation in Aleppo has just got worse and worse. We're constantly worried for them. We're constantly worried for, for everyone in Syria. It's an untenable situation. Um, but certainly, you know, they never lose hope, and, and, and whilst the world leaders um, sit around and seem to struggle to find solutions, they continue their work on the ground, doing this incredible heroic work. What was very clear also was uh, the, the threat posed by Russia that constantly when they're looking up to the skies in Aleppo, it's a Russian warplane which is bombing them. Has that involvement really added a new dimension of danger for the people of Aleppo? I mean, certainly what we hear from them is that they are neutral, they are impartial, they will save anyone on all sides of the conflict, but that they, like other humanitarian groups, are being targeted by the regime and its allies. Certainly, you know, you see also in the film not just the white helmets being targeted, but the bombing of a, of a Médecins Sans Frontières hospital um, and the doctors there being targeted. I don't think that in any war humanitarian aid workers should be targeted and certainly the White Helmets are asking for that to stop. That's right. We did see President Bashar al-Assad of Syria overnight actually. Uh, he was asked about the White Helmets and whether they should the, win the Nobel Peace Prize and his response was to suggest that they are politicised. Did you notice that at all in your dealings with this group? Not at all. And again, you know, there is a complex situation with people with real agendas. Certainly, these are, these are the, the people in Syria who seem to have the least agenda. Their agenda is to save life. They've saved over 60,000 lives so far. They're nominated for the Nobel Prize this year. They have endorsers across the world, both on the ground in Syria and in, in the annals of power in many countries. They won the Right Livelihood Award yesterday. So certainly, the, if, if their agenda is to save life, then it's one that I would support. How did you go about making this film? How did you go about filming it in such a dangerous place and then getting the footage out? Mm -hmm. We collaborated with the White Helmets themselves. They record so many of the incidents, so many of the rescues that they conduct. They're actually recording those. So there are uh, um, tens, dozens of hours of footage of these uh, of these rescues and we worked very closely with them to, to use that footage interspersed with the training footage. We lived with them for five weeks in southern Turkey whilst they trained to do more and more of this rescue work. So we think it was a great collaboration. Having seen what you've seen and having spoken to them over a long period, do you have any hope that uh, a political solution can be reached in what is such a complex war now? What I certainly have is hope in humanity. It's impossible to spend time with these guys and not have that hope. Um, I can only hope that that humanity extends to our political leaders and that they can find a solution um, that works for the civilians on the ground. Well, congratulations on the film, Joanna. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much.